Welcome to Rule the World, the art and power of storytelling. Storytelling is what connects us as humans, and for brands, it is no different. A well-told story can effectively position your brand in the minds and hearts of your audience, and can convert thoughts and feelings into results and revenue. On this show, we dive into the unique and recurring principles of world-class storytellers from every walk of life to help you level up your storytelling skills and knowledge to drive real, measurable results for you and your organization. Here's your host, Paul Furlong. Growing up, my brother Daniel and I would play make-believe for hours on end. The reason for this was that my parents had moved us out of one of the roughest parts of the city in order to give us some opportunities. But in doing so, my mum had to work five jobs and my dad had to work two. And this meant that all of the money that they made just about covered the mortgage to put a roof over our head and to put the food on our table. So the house that we lived in had no furniture, and we only had carpets in a few of the rooms that we lived in. And Daniel and I had no toys to play with. So our playtime was making up stories and playing them out as make-believe play. So that may have been a stick off a tree from the street, or cutting out cereal boxes, attaching them to toilet roll tubes, and turning ourselves into deep-sea divers. <laughs> Before we went to bed every night, my dad would read us bedtime stories. Not from the new books that we couldn't afford to buy, but from books that he'd kept from his childhood. Lord of the Rings, Swallows and Amazons, The Hobbit. Great, well-told stories that had stood the test of time. And these started to make their way into our make-believe play. And then as finances started to ease a little bit, mom and dad would take us out to do the thing that they loved to do when they were dating before Daniel and I came along. It didn't happen very often, so it was very special when it happened. They would take us to the cinema. So we would see stories played out on an enormous screen. It didn't matter what the film was, it didn't matter if it was any good, but when the experience finished, apparently, I don't remember this, but apparently, I would cry because the experience had finished. And then as we grew up a little bit, homework started to come in from school. We had musical instruments to practice. That would squeeze our playtime. But it didn't matter to Daniel and I. We would just have to play that little bit more intensely to have time to play out our stories, even if it was just for 10 minutes a day. And then I remember very, very distinctly, when I was 11, mum and dad showed me the film, Edward Hands. How many of you have seen this? That's a great film. But for me, it wasn't just the story of Edward Scissorhands, it was how the story was told that had the great impact on me. How the music told the story, how the costume design told the story, how the makeup, the production design told the story, how they came to tell what already was a pretty incredible story and make it more than the sum of its parts. And at this point, I knew what I was going to spend the rest of my life doing. I was going to tell stories, I was going to do it visually, and I was going to do it by Telling, making films and television. So for the next few years, when I wasn't doing homework, practicing musical instruments, or playing with Daniel, I was researching how to make movies. So I even knew what a best boy did and what a gaffer did. But then as good parents do, my parents told me I needed to focus on my studies and get a proper job. So I went to Newcastle University, having shelved my dream of making film and television, and I studied physiological science. So if any of you have a desire to know how the structure of any of your organs relates to its function, then please come and see me afterwards. <laughs> During the second summer of university, I realized that I really didn't want to study physiological science. My microscope was fast becoming my best friend, and it had nothing to do with telling stories or making movies. So I got a group of mates from back home together, and we made a short film. We'd never done it before, we didn't know how to do it, but we had to go. We called it Perfecting Loneliness, and it was the greatest experience I'd ever had up until that point in my life. 
And at that point, I knew, yes, definitely, I am going to make movies for the rest of my life. I went back to uni, I finished my degree, and I walked straight into a TV job, straight out of uni. I now have 54 episodes of television to my name for BBC and ITV. I've made nine short films, one that took me to the Cannes Film Festival, as Andy mentioned, and one that I've worked with Morgan on uh, for BFI. And I'm currently producing three feature films, one with the Oscar-nominated writer of Shrek, which is pretty cool. Opus Media, we work with uh, a number of corporate clients, including these. And I tell, uh, I, I uh, do talks like this for a number of these companies as well to help them better tell corporate stories so that they can make more money. So why do I tell you this? Because storytelling is at the heart of everything I do and everything that I've done since I was very, very small. And what I've found about stories is that told right and told at the right time, they have a great potential to change lives by inspiring and leading people. And so my hope for today is that by the end of this session, I will have imparted to you some of the things that I've learned about how to tell a great story and that you will leave here with uh, a bank of stories, or the beginnings of a bank of stories, that you can take away, either into BNI or into your business, that you can start to tell and see immediate impact. Would that be okay? Yeah. That'd be helpful? Yes, okay, brilliant. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about why we should tell stories, which stories to tell and when, what order our stories should be told in, who the hero of the story should be, and I've got eight words that all begin with C, which is very helpful, that should all make their way into a story, and that will make your story as engaging as possible. So let's start with why we should tell stories. This is one of the Lascaux cave paintings in France. And it was painted during the Paleolithic era, somewhere between 17,000 and 37,000 years ago. Anthropologists can't agree when modern language as we know it today, first evolved. But they think it was towards the end of the Paleolithic era. And you can see on this picture, it tells uh, of an ancient hunting ritual. It tells the story of that. So before modern language as we know it today evolved, people were telling stories to collect and communicate information, before language. Simply put, Humans are wired to share stories. And there's lots of science around why we should tell stories. Loads of it. I could stand here all day and go into it. But I want to tell you two that I think are the most powerful scientific experiments that have been done as to why we should share stories. And the first one was done at Princeton University. A lady volunteered to have her brain scanned in an MRI machine. And you'll know when an MRI scan is done that various different parts of the brain light up as various things happen in the brain. So as her brain was being scanned, they asked her to tell a story. And they recorded the story that she told. And then a group of volunteers then had their brain scanned, and the recorded story that the lady told was played back to, back to them. And the miraculous thing that happened was that their, the listener's brains mirrored exactly the brain of the storyteller. They were completely and utterly synchronized. So when her insular cortex lit up, which is an emotional part of the brain, so did the listeners. When the storyteller's frontal cortex lit up, so did the listeners. And this is called neural coupling. So when we tell a story, our brains synchronize with our listeners' brains. It's not just our brains that react to stories, so do our hormones, our endocrine system. So our reward and pleasure centers link up because of dopamine release. Oxytocin is released, which is the, known as the love hormone. And so are endorphins, the feel-good hormone. Oxytocin is probably the most important because that endears us to the storyteller because it creates empathy. It makes us want to cooperate with them. It's really powerful stuff. Hands up if you've seen the film Inception. Yeah? It's basically the same thing. Yeah? Leonardo DiCaprio's character, Cobb, in Inception, describes Inception as shared dreaming. It's basically neural coupling. But in Inception, people have to be asleep. 
It's not the case with storytelling. You can do it anytime, anywhere. And in Inception, they're doing it for nefarious purposes. They're trying to steal corporate secrets. Storytelling, we're not. We're telling stories to help people, to inspire people to have better lives. How great is that? And this is what great leaders of the past have always known. They've always done it. They've used storytelling for as long as, we can, as, long as we've known about it to inspire people to have better lives. <laughs> and this guy, this guy is a genius. He thinks he's a stable genius. <laughs> but I genuinely think he's a genius. He's a storytelling genius. And the proof is in the pudding. In the 2016 presidential election in America, he ran against Hillary Clinton, who all political experts would agree was the more qualified candidate to win the presidency. But she didn't win. Why? Nobody liked her. Yeah. And nobody liked her because she, all she went around talking about was policies, facts, and figures. What did Donald Trump do? He told stories. And he connected with people emotionally. Mike talked about this yesterday morning. We have to get more emotional in BNI and in business. And he did that by telling stories. And the most important story he ever told, he did in four words. Make America great again. Four words. Brilliant story. And I mentioned that later on, I'm going to talk about the eight C's of storytelling. Eight parts of a story that we need to include to make the story as good as possible. The fewer of the eight we have, the less compelling the story is likely to be. In Make America Great Again, Donald Trump included seven. That's incredible for just four words. And when we get to that point, tick them off. Count which ones he got and which one he missed. How many of you have seen the first Pirates of the Caribbean film? Yeah? I'm going to show you a short clip, and then I'll tell you why. When I get the pearl back, I'm going to teach it to the whole crew. And we'll sing it all the time. Then you will be positively the most fearsome pirates in the Spanish main. Not just the Spanish main, love. The entire ocean. The entire world. <clears throat> Wherever we want to go, we can go. That's what a ship is, you know. It's not just a keel and a hole and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is. What the Black Pearl really is. Is freedom. So why do I show you that clip? Because when it comes to telling a story, the place we need to start is with the reason why we're telling the story. We need to have a full understanding of why we're telling it. What's the benefit? What do we want out of it? So when we tell a story, What's the benefit of the product or the service or the idea that we want to get across? It's never really the thing that we're trying to sell. So Jack says, what a ship needs is the deck, the hull, the keel, and the sails. But what a ship is, what the black pearl really is, is freedom. So let me give you an example in BNI terms. And you can do this for your business, but BNI is the thing that we all have in common, so I'm going to use BNI as an example. So, We've seen this a couple of times this weekend, and you'll have seen it throughout your BNI journey. Start chapters, fill chapters, retain members, all by telling stories. Let me use the fill chapters as an example. We go on and on and on at members that we need to grow their chapter. What does that really mean to the average member? Yeah, so if we tell a member to fill a chapter, Probably doesn't mean anything in those terms. More business. What does that actually mean? More money. What does that actually mean? That's still all the keel, the deck, the hull, and the sails. Better quality of life. Better quality of life. Okay. So we're we're getting closer, but that's still the keel, the hull, the deck, and the sails. Quality of life is the closest. Let me give you some examples. So fill the chapter. Great. More members. So what? More relationships in the room. So what? More opportunities to do business. So what? More business done, we're getting closer. More money in the business, great. More profit, hopefully, if they're doing it right. More money in their bank account, great. 
Better quality of life, we're getting there. Better quality of life might be debt's paid off. Great, that's, the, that's good. Debt's paid off. Less time in the business so they can spend more time with their family. Great. Now we're talking freedom. Holiday of a lifetime, bucket list holiday. That's freedom. Something we've just had in Manchester, and this was amazing, because they grew their chapter, they have, they're a charity, they've just gone and bought a bus for their charity, a homeless charity, and they now, as a charity, go out onto the streets of Manchester every night, they have 16 beds on the bus, and they take 16 homeless people off the streets every night and give them somewhere to shower and sleep every night of the week. That's what Jack's talking about when he talks about the freedom. No one cares about more members. That's what people care about. So if you turn to page, I think it's page 39 in your book, you'll see a table that looks a bit like this. Your desired outcome might be more members. In column two, write down the benefits that more members will bring, or whatever story you want to, you want to do. BNI related, business related, life related, doesn't matter. Whatever story you want to do. And remember, people are motivated by one of only two things. Pain or gain? What pain are you going to remove from them? Or what goal are they going to achieve? The pain one tends to be a better motivator. So make sure you've got a bit of both. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to write down as many benefits as you can. Try and get a good mix. We're not going to finish this table today. I want you to go away and finish it, but I do find that if I get you started, you're more likely to go away and finish it than if I just preach at you. In the next column, story headline, write down a story, uh, a word that will jog your memory of a story where you've delivered that benefit. Forget desired outcome. Cover that column up. I'm not bothered about the desired outcome at the moment. We'll come back to this at the very end. A word or two that will jog your memory of one of a time when you've delivered one of the benefits. So, I mentioned bucket list type holiday, holiday of a lifetime. Remember in Merseyside, they've always wanted to visit Machu Picchu. They've just come back from Machu Picchu. Amazing, because they grew their chapter. That's a great story. So I would just write in that column, Machu Picchu, Dave. That's enough in that column. So write down just a couple of words that will remind you of a, a, a time when you've done that. And then in column four, this is the emotional bit. It's not really a story without emotions. Yash was talking about this last night. Need to get emotional. Mike was talking about it as well. What feelings were involved for you and for the other people involved in the story? Let's try and get away from primary school descriptors here. Happy, sad, a bit boring. Be a bit inventive with your descriptors. How did they feel before? How did they feel during? How do they feel now? Okay, any fans of Star Wars? Yes, big fan of Star Wars down here. So you'll know who these people are, Luke Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luke Skywalker is the hero of the saga, and Obi-Wan Kenobi is his mentor who guides him all the way through the film, either as a human or as a hologram. The thing I love most about Obi-Wan Kenobi is never once does he try and become the hero. When we're telling our stories, we must never, ever be the hero. If we become the hero, one, we look like a show-off. Nobody likes a show-off. And two, this is more important. If we tell a story where we've made someone else the hero, the listener is going to want to become the hero as well. And who can make them the hero? You can, because you made the other person the hero. And so they're going to want to work with you, because they know if you can make someone else the hero, you can make them the hero. You are the hero maker. So never, ever be the hero in any story that involves you. Always help other people to be the hero. 
It doesn't take a lot to rework your stories, but you do need to look at all of them and make sure that the other people in the stories are your heroes. Okay, I'm going to move on to the eight C's of storytelling. The more you include, the better, the more engaging your story will be. The fewer you have, the less you will connect with your listeners. First one is characters. Fairly obvious, who's in the story? Stephen King says, the best stories are always about people rather than the events. Use first names, makes it personal. Surnames, it starts to get a bit boring. And a little bit of description, but not too much. When writing for film and television, the advice is to talk about hair and makeup and how they entered a room. Because the brain's a funny thing. We've all got memories. And when we give a little bit of description, the brain fills in the gaps around what we don't say. So if we use just these two things, the brain will do the rest in the listener. So let me give you an example. I could talk about Ben. You don't know who Ben is. I could go through a long list of character traits about Ben. Or I could do the hair, makeup, and how he entered the room. So if I said to you, Ben skulked into the room, stinking the lynx, with his hair unkempt, you've got a pretty good idea of who Ben is. You know pretty much how old he is. You know kind of what clothes he's wearing. You know how he's likely to speak. Your memory has done the rest of the work. Next one is circumstance. Two parts to this, where were you and why were you there? Again, with the where were you, let's let their subconscious fill in the gaps. Let's talk to the five senses. Something like, we couldn't hear ourselves think when we walked into the station, but the air conditioning was a welcome relief from the heat outside, as was the smell emanating from a nearby pizza restaurant. Yeah, just talk to five senses, it took me three seconds, and you're all, in, you're all in the place that I want you. Possibly different places, because you've all got different experiences of those five things. But I didn't reel off a big, long list of exactly what the place looked like, because your subconscious did the rest of the work. And the second part is, why were you there? So, did you put yourself there? Did you offer the help? Did somebody call you and ask for your help? Or did you cause the problem in the first place? A little bit of context here is key without going into too much detail. Third one, Yash talked about this last night. Without conflict, there is no story. So just have a look down the list that you've started. If there's no conflict, just scribble it out. If you can't see a problem that was overcome, scribble it out. There's no story. And the important thing here is the feelings. You need to pinpoint the pain point of the person who was having the problem, and you need to drill into it a little bit. You need to bring it out. You don't need to lie. You don't need to exaggerate. But you need to find out what they were struggling with and how they felt about it and explore that a little bit. The fourth one is cure. What cure did the person that you helped apply to the conflict? Did you notice how I phrased that? What cure did the person you helped apply to the conflict? Not what cure did you apply, because you're Obi-Wan. They're the hero. Fifth is change. As a result of the cure that they applied, what change happened? How did they feel different after the cure was applied? What were the benefits? You've already got your list of benefits. So what was the benefit to them as a result of all the help that was given? Six, what was the carry-out message? So in my B&I example from before, about Dave who went to Peru, it might be, and this is where we come back to desired outcome, Dave managed to get the holiday of a lifetime to Peru, and he did it because he got more business by growing more relationships, and he did it because he grew his chapter. It's the only point you come back to the very beginning. 
Now, if there are any NLP practitioners in the room, you may be disagreeing with me at this point, because NLP has a tradition of storytelling, a metaphor, where they leave the subconscious to unwrap the carry-on message. And I agree that this is very, very powerful. But we live in a very busy world, and sometimes people just don't have the time for the subconscious to unwrap the story. So my suggestion would be, unless you're in a very calm, meditative retreat, perhaps we can unwrap the carry-out message for the people listening to the story. Seven is conversation. We need to pepper our story with a little bit of dialogue. Not too much, because then it becomes he said, she said. But a little bit. Maybe at the most emotive points, just to give it, just to elevate it a little bit, take it to the next level. And for those of you keeping count, this is the one that Donald Trump missed in Make America Great Again. And eight, curiosity. To hold people in the palm of your hand as you're telling the story, you need them to remain curious. And how do you do it? Well, you might want to set something up early and not pay it off until the end. I've just done it with Donald Trump. I asked you to keep count. And I've only just paid it off. That was about 10 minutes ago. You might want to say something outrageous, like Donald Trump's a genius. Or you might want to put a little bit of showmanship into it, like quoting from a movie or from a well-known proverb. So what I hope you've got there are the beginnings of a bank of stories that you can take and use either in BNI or in your business life and some principles that you can apply to those stories. The more that you use, the more impact your stories are likely to have. If you would like to know more about storytelling, I host a podcast where I interview some of the world's greatest storytellers. I've interviewed the likes of the Oscar-nominated writer of Shrek, Roger Shulman. I've interviewed Tony Woolerscroft, who is the uh, photographer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Foo Fighters. I've interviewed Andy Bounds, who's a sales genius. You may have heard him speak at BNI before, and I've interviewed BNI's very own Dr. Ivan Meisner. You will get that on any uh, podcast or wherever you usually get your podcasts. And as Andy mentioned yesterday, Phil Berg, Andy, Sarah, and I have also written a book uh, called Success in Business and Life, and you'll be able to get that out in the corridor after the session. My last piece of advice for you about storytelling is that whether it's the first or the 101st time that you're telling your story, you have to make sure that your listener is living it with you. Think about Inception. It's what they were doing in that Paris scene. And the only way that they're going to live it with you is if you're reliving it. So in order to retell it, you have to relive the story. And remember, as Plato said, those who tell the stories rule the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Rule the World. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit weareopusmedia.com for more resources based on today's topic, as well as access to more episodes that will help you develop your storytelling abilities. That's weareopusmedia.com. Thank you, and see you next time.